was a handful in 1983 also. Um, and um, I want to recognize uh, Bill for being AMSEC's liaison to ELSO for 14 years up until 2015. 14 years representing profusionist interests to uh, the ELSO organization. And, and I appreciated that, and um, I know that several AMSEC members have uh, appreciated that also. Um, I herald from uh, Syracuse, New York, about half of my life, and Cleveland, Ohio, the other half of my life. Uh, Scott, the chief perfusionist from University Hospital in Syracuse, is here, uh, too, at the, at the meeting. Um, I was assigned this topic, which is great. Uh, it's good to get up out of the oxygen transfer theory for uh, a few minutes here and, and uh, talk about simulation and why it's important to perfusionists. Uh, here are my disclosures. Um, I do have a financial interest in uh, Biomedical Simulations, Inc. and the Califia Simulator. Uh, so uh, anything I say about that, uh, you, can, you can put that uh, uh, in context. Um, High-fidelity extracorporeal simulation or high-fidelity perfusion simulation. HFPS, HFES are becoming uh, common acronyms, uh, especially with the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion and with uh, AMSECT and uh, probably ELSO. Um, why is it important to perfusionists? Because perfusionist students are being taught with simulators now. Every perfusion education program has a hemodynamic hydroelectric simulator uh, in their program. The two new programs that are starting in the United States uh, considered step one to procure a simulator. Uh, you aren't a perfusion education program anymore unless you have access to simulation and simulators. Um, and we're writing standards and guidelines for high fidelity extracorporeal simulation. Uh, AMSECT, the American Academy of Cardiovascular Perfusion, and the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion have had a committee that's worked for the last five years to write standards and guidelines for what high fidelity extracorporeal circulation is. Uh, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion has recognized uh, um, high fidelity perfusion simulation centers. I'll talk more about that. Um, our MD counterparts, uh, team members, RNs and RTs are all being taught uh, ECLIS with high fidelity extracorporeal simulation techniques, simulators and standards. Um, it's important to us. Your OR team members and ICU team members uh, are all starting to use simulation as part of their, their training uh, in their residencies and in their, their education programs. Simulation is ubiquitous. It's, uh, it's permeating uh, education in the healthcare uh, sciences and in medicine. Uh, thoracic surgeons are using simulation to attract young medical students into the path, path, path for uh, thoracic surgery training um, and using the uh, the sexiness of uh, simulations, if you will, uh, to attract members. Our vendor partners, our vendor partners have all invested in simulation for years. They all have uh, simulation centers uh, in their, their national headquarters, international headquarters. Uh, one company has six simulators that they've deployed around the world uh, and are in use uh, in demonstrations like the one we saw today uh, uh, with Levanova and Tandem Heart. The American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, our, our certifying agency, has recognized high fidelity perfusion uh, simulation centers. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. There are eight centers now that have qualified for this designation. And basically, uh, these centers can provide uh, clinical um, cases that count towards your 40 cases per year. You can have up to 15 cases that can be run on a simulator. Uh, just like you can have 15 op cabs or 15 ECMO shifts uh, as part of your, your, national uh, your national recertification, maintenance of certification. And most important of all, um, high fidelity extracorporeal perfusion simulation moves the practice of doing bypass or doing ECMO or doing any extracorporeal procedure and the errors that have come with that uh, to the preclinical or prepatient uh, educational phase. We're going to make our mistakes in the sim lab. We're going to practice making mistakes in the sim lab. Uh, we're going to pump air in the sim lab. We're going to have devices fail in the sim lab. Uh, we're going to do all that practicing uh, before we get into the operating room. Um, and moving that uh, back is, is very important. You've all heard of uh, C1, 
do one, uh, teach one. Uh, this is the old Halstead uh, methodology, and our physician counterparts can speak to this more than I can. Um, but uh, this method is, is still being used, but it's being adjusted. Uh, they're moving the, the do one back to practice many. See one, practice many, practice many. Then go do one on a human. So there's this whole uh, uh, weighted effort of, of practicing many. Um, just to, to reinforce this, and this diagrams in, in the abstract, um, if you look at when surgical students or residents go clinical, or when perfusion students go clinically, um, there's a lot of didactic learning that goes on, a lot of seeing and watching, and then when they get into the operating room with the patient and they start practicing, then the learning curve uh, becomes very steep. Uh, at SUNY and other perfusion education programs, we've moved that learning curve back to the preclinical phase. Uh, we're doing full mission simulations of cases uh, in the simulation lab. The students will have as many as 30 or 40 full simulated cases before they go into the operating room and run a case on a human. What's that do? That moves the risk to the patient uh, that comes from that type of learning uh, back to um, back to the preclinical phase, and there's less risk to student to the to the patient and the team and the team dynamics. Uh, it's interesting in the in the operating room when a student goes into the operating room and something interesting or challenging or uh, bad starts happening. The student is often often pushed aside, and the preceptor steps in and takes over. In the simulation lab, it's all about the student and the learner. It's not about the patient. Um, they're in there to practice what they're going to do when they see that error or that situation appear clinically. Um, here's the list of eight programs that the American Board of uh, Cardiovascular Perfusion have recognized this high fidelity perfusion uh, simulation accredited recognized centers. They call it recognition. They don't call it accreditation. I do not speak for the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, by the way. Um, this is my interpretation. Um, they're going to use uh, simulation in the future, I'm sure, at some point, maybe not in our careers, but at some point as part of the basic testing for certification and perfusion. You'll graduate from your perfusion education program, you'll report to a regional simulation center, and you'll demonstrate that you're a safe perfusionist. Then you'll go off to practice. And uh, once every five years and once every ten years, you'll visit that regional simulation center near you and participate in some type of simulation activity as part of your maintenance of continued uh, certification. Some of our uh, MD brethren, the anesthesiologists, I believe have put a one in 10 year uh, simulation participation requirement in their maintenance of, of certification. Um, it's a great place to orient to new equipment uh, like we saw at lunchtime with the ProTech Duo cannula and with the, uh, the tandem heart, the new oxygenator, that, or their tandem lung, um, they have differences between other devices. And it's better to learn those in a simulator than it is to learn them on a patient, uh, in my opinion, and other people's opinion. Uh, high fidelity perfusion simulation um, uh, is a great place to practice the high risk, uh, high air, low frequency events that, that we see every day. Um, or we hear about every day. We don't see them every day. Uh, the incidence of uh, arterial air embolism is about 1 in 750 to 1 in 1,000 patients on bypass. That will take some of us three, four years of practice to, to have a, a probability, a chance of seeing that. We can go in the sim lab and do it five times in a row in, in a half hour period uh, and get comfortable with whatever we're, we're going to use to do that. Um, just to show you how serious this has become and why you need to be concerned about this and why it's important to you is there are standards and guidelines for the simulation centers that are, that are growing up in the United States uh, to do extracorporeal uh, simulation. This is our policy and procedure manual from the SUNY Perfusion uh, Simulation Center. Uh, it's recognized by the American Board uh, and um, we have faculty members who are becoming certified as um, certified healthcare uh, simulation educators. Um, so there's micro circulation or micro certifications in this area, and I'll talk about those more tomorrow. 
I know you can't read this very well, um, but it's about the safety of the simulation, uh, the safety of the learner. Uh, we want them to be in psychologically safe environments as well as physically safe environments. Uh, we want there to be a curriculum. We want the simulations to be consistent, uh, scorable, gradable. Um, we look at things like inter-rater uh, variability uh, when judging people, um, judging learners in these simulations. We've had the opportunity to bring students from other perfusion education programs and expert uh, perfusionists in and run them through the same scenarios with the same rating uh, scales. And it's very exciting to, to watch our students grow and watch uh, uh, the differences between perfusion education programs uh, and how students perform. Um, I just put a couple examples up here of some of the more important simulations that we can do. Uh, we've certainly heard uh, about the Hardigman syndrome. We've heard about recirculation. Uh, these are best, uh, in my opinion, taught by sitting behind a simulator and the instructor actually challenged the, the learner with these uh, oxygen transfer conditions and situations. Give the learner a chance to diagnose the problem and then fix the problem with the simulator. And we can do this uh, uh, consistently uh, with the simulators that we have today and the scenarios that we're building today. Um, this is a list from uh, a group of European physicians and what they've done with simulators to, to teach uh, doctors. Here's a list that uh, just came out of the Annals of uh, Cardiology and Anesthesia, of Cardiac Anesthesia, um, my, pro my challenge. Uh, and they're at a point where they're doing a lot of basic education as part of their simulation, uh, but certainly the communication piece under stress uh, high stress environments, uh, the communication, the team behaviors that should go on, uh, and practicing uh, handling situations uh, in mock codes. Um, many ICUs uh, that practice monthly uh, doing insight to simulation uh, where they have patients who are coding are now putting ECMO on the end of those codes, and the ECMO team is being called to those insight to. Uh, uh, monthly simulations, um, which I think is very exciting. So uh, when I was a student, we pumped buckets. This is low fidelity uh, simulation. Um, you see two lines gone, and we call this guy Billy Bucket. Um, uh, the Orpheus simulator uh, uh, has been with us for more than a decade, uh, coming out of Australia. Um, we found ways to connect plastic hearts and uh, bovine hearts to the, the simulator such that uh, the heart is pressurized, has a normal right atrial pressure, the aorta is pressurized, and residents uh, can cannulate uh, those beating hearts uh, and even these plastic devices. You saw two excellent examples of mannequins today at lunchtime uh, that have cannulatable vessels that feel real and uh, physicians can practice uh, Seldinger techniques. Um, um, New devices uh, with the simulator and, and uh, uh, the ability to, uh, to connect those hearts as I discussed. And then certainly we can mimic uh, the monitors that we use in ICU in our simulators uh, and put real numbers in there that are believable and the, simu and the, the monitors uh, behave like uh, real patients behave. Um, another reason why we should be very concerned and very involved is the training of cardiothoracic, thoracic surgery residents uh, has included uh, a simulation curriculum since 2008. And you can see the names of the, the physicians on the lower right-hand side from the Thoracic Surgery uh, Directors Association. And the JC, the Joint Committee on Thoracic Surgery Education, has also endorsed the use of, of simulation uh, for training thoracic surgery residents, especially in procedures that they don't get to see uh, aortic dissections uh, and, and uh, large aortic surgery. Um, and we're teaching in the boot camps for the thoracic surgery residents, we're teaching them every aspect of cardiopulmonary bypass, every step, what we're doing, um, and this is one of the checkoff sheets that they use in the boot camp for the thoracic surgery residents. Perfusionists have worked with uh, surgeons to increase the fidelity of these boot camp experiences. So we should be very uh, concerned and involved and aware of what's happening in the training of the new thoracic surgery residents that, that we're getting. Um, 
we had a program at uh, Mayo Clinic uh, that we did for eight years in a row where we had residents come in from uh, programs around the United States and, and uh, uh, we shared what we were doing at Mayo and we did it in the simulation lab and the residents got to rotate through the anesthesia surgeon and perfusionist position uh, in doing this training. Uh, another reason um, and is that uh, there's multidisciplinary team training going on in the United States, um, uh, teaching us how to behave as a team, uh, showing each other respect, uh, increasing uh, communication, um, and the non-technical skills of communication uh, are being taught and practiced. Um, when we had new employees uh, come at Mayo uh, to the cardiac OR, four times a year quarterly, we'd go to the, uh, the simulation center and we'd practice four or five different simulations. We did the same ones every time. The surgeons came, the anesthesiologists came. Uh, new CRNAs, new residents uh, from anesthesia um, and thoracic surgery would take a break and come over to the sim lab and we would do these uh, scenarios uh, to orient new employees uh, to, uh, to cardiac surgery. Um, here's a simulation that went on in Australia three days ago uh, in the Austro-Asian um, uh, meeting. Um, simulation at meetings is, uh, is prevalent uh, around the world. Here's a, uh, uh, an in situ uh, simulation at a New York hospital. Uh, we uh, oriented 22 nurses to cannulation in ICU and going on ECMO. Uh, and here is, I'm sorry, uh, here is uh, a simulation training program that went on over at uh, Mayo Clinic and in Scottsdale just this last weekend. Uh, lots of participants um, and it's, it's interesting the, the knowledge and quality of the, the colleagues, the, the attendees uh, to these meetings are getting smarter and, and more sophisticated uh, which is pushing uh, the meeting presenters uh, to do better. Uh, you saw some morning, this morning, um, <clears throat> well right before lunch, uh, that paper about uh, ECMO as a team sport uh, and one hospital reported that their survival rate increased from 39% to 54% just by treating the ECMO team more like a team and doing team activities like simulation. Um, so to summarize, uh, why should you get excited? Why should you get ready and get going about simulation? Um, it's really interesting uh, in the last survey where there was a simulation question asking perfusionists uh, uh, if you look at the far right-hand column, about a third of the respondents said they would never be involved in simulation. And I think that's wishful thinking nowadays. Um, uh, there are some of us that are going to retire and you probably won't have to confront simulation as part of your clinical practice uh, or uh, be involved in it. Uh, and it might be a third of us um, if we retire soon enough. Um, but we're going we're gonna to be asked there's nobody that makes a better simulation facilitator than a perfusionist or a respiratory therapist. When you go around the simulation centers around the United States, uh, the people that have the job of the technical uh, facilitator, the technical person, uh, typically are respiratory therapists and or perfusionists. More respiratory therapists in my, in my uh, experience. Um, get ready for national certification. Um, it's going, to, it's going to happen in, uh, in the next five or 10 years. Um, I'll talk tomorrow about how this is compressing on us and, and how you might feel like the sky is falling because of simulation and some other activities that are going on right now. Um, but thank you for your attention.